Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Welcome back. Um, so uh, let me just uh, start with this announcement and uh, short, sorry about the short notice. Um, on uh, the week of April 29th, which is uh, two weeks from now, uh, there will be no classes because I have some pre-arranged uh, meeting, uh, Zoom meeting, I'm not, not going anywhere, uh, but uh, it's going to be very intensive, so I just cannot uh, teach then. And uh, these two classes are moved uh, to, to the week after. Uh, so I hope uh, that, that this doesn't uh, cause um, inconvenience. Um, and uh, yeah. Do you mean March? Sorry? Do you mean March, not April? Because it's only not two weeks. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, that's absolutely yes. That's and, and actually, I, I got uh, the dates right. So it's it's not not that that uh, it's it's not not that at the end of April I have something. I have something at the end of uh, what did we say? March. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. So uh, March and this one would be April. Yes. Thanks. I knew it was two weeks from now, but I was just checking calendar uh, to see when exactly is that. So this is also April. All right. Okay, so this is being recorded. So, uh, okay, I, I cannot uh, cannot look at, at the calendar. Um, anyway, so uh, if you're still with me uh, today, um, we are doing two things. Uh, first one uh, will basically rewind uh, the proof that we covered so far. Uh, just to see where we are exactly, and uh, then we'll jump straight uh, into the part that we haven't covered. Um, so uh, yeah, so so I think we we are getting there. We we'll still have time to do a few more things uh, after we are done with this proof. Uh, okay, so so here is what we have proven so far. Now uh, I should uh, specify uh, that uh, the unit ball. Uh, of B of H is considered with respect to the weak operator topology. Uh, I should also specify that I'm saying this just for definiteness. It really makes no difference. Uh, take weak operator topology, strong operator topology, take strong star operator topology if you want. Uh, everything that, that uh, I'm saying uh, works for either one of them, but I should just be precise. So, so basically any of the three usual uh, Polish topologies on unit ball does it. Uh, and uh, here is uh, what uh, what we did in the past uh, few weeks uh, gives us module something I'll cover. There is one, one little gap in this. Uh, so suppose it feeds an automorphism of the Kalkin algebra and that it has the property that for every epsilon greater than zero, there is an element in part which has this property that uh, the length of the intervals converge to infinity. And there is an infinite uh, set index set X, uh, which has the property that phi has a C measurable epsilon approximation on uh, this dx of E, right? So this is discretization of uh, D of E, but only uh, the uh, part uh, that is indexed by X, then uh, OCAT implies that phi is inner. Uh, now I should probably remind you quickly what is uh, C measurable means uh, measurable with respect to the sigma algebra generated by analytic sets. Uh, so pre-images of uh, weakly open sets are analytic are okay in the sigma algebra generated by analytic sets uh, inside uh, this space. And remember, this space uh, has natural Cantor set topology. It is a product of finite sets. Epsilon approximation just means uh, what you would guess it does. So it is a function from uh, dx of e into unit ball of b of h, such that, uh, actually let me, I should probably call it something. So what this means is that if you take theta of a, and uh, if you take phi star of a, phi, phi star is any lifting of a, and if you send this to the Kalkin algebra and compute the norm, this is at most epsilon for every a, in this uh, uh, domain space. And uh, as before, I just write d sub x and drop this e if uh, e is clear from the context. So I claim that it, this is uh, what we have modulo uh, one small detail. So uh, let's, let's see uh, how the proof goes. So first, uh, 
we proved that uh, our assumption that we have a C measurable epsilon approximations on uh, dx of E. Uh, okay, so I should be precise here. Here quantifier is different. And actually since this is different, let me just say for every F in part N, here it is DF. Uh, so so uh, basically uh, the assumption was that, that we have these epsilon approximations uh, somewhere, but, uh, but by this little isomorphism, isometry trick, uh, we can get those epsilon approximations at the very same place. And th that place can be any, any element, any D of F. All right. Now uh, the next, the next element of the proof is that uh, we can go from C measurable epsilon approximation all the way to continuous lifting. So uh, this, this used a couple of tricks. One was the Yankov von Neumann uniformization uh, theorem, uh, which, uh, which made it possible to move from having epsilon approximation for all epsilons to actual lifting, which is C measurable. And uh, then from C measurable to continuous, we use this uh, analysis of um, uh, meager sets in product spaces. Uh, this is a trick that, that definitely takes a big advantage of the fact that, that all of these, uh, that dy of e is a product of, of finite sets. All right, so at this point we have continuous lifting. Once we have that, well, then uh, we, you know, uh, tinkered uh, with this uh, continuous lifting and uh, made sure by these stabilizers. And remember that good proof uh, of um, construction with stabilizers was done uh, at the beginning of last class. The, I, I wasted some time plus before that, uh, making it look way more complicated than it is. So anyway, by stabilizers, uh, we made sure that, that uh, we have not just continuous lifting, but actually what we called uh, continuous lifting of product type meaning that uh, each of, of these um, factors in this big infinite product, each of the DNs is mapped separately. And uh, the way that, that you map uh, some element of uh, dy of E, you just uh, look at its uh, components, send each one separately by the corresponding maps and then put them together at the end. Um, and uh, then we argued, well, uh, if such a lifting, if such a map of product type is a lifting of a star homomorphism, then uh, theta n is going to be epsilon n approximate star homomorphism and epsilon n's converge to zero. And then we didn't say this, but, but uh, you know, by, by going to a subsequence, you might as well assume that theta n is uh, one over n approximate star homomorphism if you apply the isometry trick uh, once again. So uh, at this point, we have these uh, approximate star homomorphisms. Uh, and uh, extra thing is that we can assume that they're unital by just tweaking them a little bit and making sure that unit goes to unit and that uh, unitaries go to unitaries. Uh, and uh, then, Then uh, we used wall stability, right? What, what was done last time that uh, such uh, epsilon approximate homomorphisms can be approximated by star homomorphisms uh, up to some uh, constant uh, factor of epsilon. Uh, and uh, here is something that I didn't say, which is an exercise. Uh, so once you, basically uh, this is the same fact uh, as uh, the fact that uh, or same proof rather, uh, that uh, any automorphism of B of H is inner. So this is a nice exercise. You just basically, you know, you know where projections of rank one go and from there you can recover your unitary. There is a little bit more work, but, but uh, that's pretty much that. And same here. So, so you see uh, what we have here, uh, you have star homomorphism. Uh, star homomorphism, remember it, it maps uh, some matrix algebra M, M of C into some other matrix algebra. In the range, we also have these finite rank projections. So it's some M, K of C. And uh, okay, so it's really easier than what I said. Uh, these star homomorphisms between matrix algebras, uh, we know exactly what they are. 
right? So, so, so it's it's uh, an exercise in linear algebra pretty much uh, to describe them. And uh, since they are coming from an automorphism, uh, the multiplicity is one. Projections of rank one have to go to projections of rank one. That's again, exercise uh, similar to the proof uh, of uh, this part here, that, that uh, theta n is epsilon n star homomorphism, because if it fails infinitely often for some fixed epsilon, at the end, uh, you get contradiction. All right, so, so we get uh, partial isometry and we have it for every F again by using isometry trick uh, as many times as necessary. And uh, now here is uh, the wrinkle that I referred to. You see, we, we actually want a unitary because uh, the uniformization of coherent families of unitaries assumed they were unitaries. It could have been done with partial isometries, but we did it for unitaries, so, so we have to stick to that. Uh, so let me just say, what is the issue here? Well, look at, uh, for example, um, unilateral shift. Uh, its image in Kalkin algebra is a unitary, and now conjugation by it, uh, its restriction to, to, uh, to any of these DEs is not implemented by unitary. It is implemented by a partial isometry that has non-trivial Fredholm index. So, so it's basically this Fredholm index that, that we have to, to deal with, uh, but it's not a big deal. So uh, let's see, so, so this is continuation uh, of uh, the sketch. So a fix uh, E and fix V, so V is uh, such that that, that uh, conjugation by V dot uh, agrees, basically it lifts uh, phi on D of E, I should say on D image of D of E in the Kalkin algebra, and then just uh, compose phi with this inner automorphism. Right? V has to be a Fredholm index, a, a Fredholm operator. So if you conjugate uh, by, by, uh, by V star, uh, you get uh, automorphism again, uh, because V is not just a Fredholm operator, it's image in Kalkin algebra is a unitary. Uh, and now, uh, but by doing this, you correct the fat home index. So the restriction of phi one to D of F is, uh, okay, it's restriction to D of E is just the identity. And uh, then it's uh, an exercise to check that that, uh, not even an exercise, uh, that that restriction to any DF is implemented by unitary. So basically uh, the point is that if you have coherent family of partial isometries, you know, if any two of them agree on that smaller D of E, then all of those partial isometries have the same Fred home index. And so uh, composing with this uh, just makes them all have index zero. And then we're exactly in the situation that we had before. So uh, for each D of E, there is a unitary that implements restriction of phi to that D of E. So we have coherent family of unitaries. And this was what I said, Oh, yes, right. There is one more thing. One, one, one more thing. Uh, it's good that I have slides to remind me uh, uh, because I tend to forget things. Um, you see, there is one more thing because, uh, you know, there is D of F and uh, there is also is F of F or F of E. Remember, uh, this is operators A such that A can be written as A0 plus A1 such that A0 is in D of E even, and A1 is in D of E odd, right? So, so this, this uh, Banach subspace, which is not a subalgebra itself, um, the theorem about coherent family symmetries uh, was dealing with this and not with D of E's. So, so we just need to make this small step from one to the other. And this is uh, something that, that is uh, uh, in the errata. I just forgot to prove that because I, you know, I just assumed uh, it's obvious, uh, uh, which it isn't. Uh, so, so, so here is the statement. Um, so suppose that, that uh, E is uh, in part N and we have these two unitaries, uh, which are both uh, in L infinity and uh, UE uh, works on D of E even, that that's why it's called E, it's E for even. Let me just highlight in appropriate color. And uh, U of E O works on the odd ones, right? This is the situation that we have so far. And uh, they both agree on D of E, right? And, and uh, D of E 
is exactly the intersection of D of E even and D of E odd. Uh, then uh, we can find a single unitary uh, such that conjugation by W agrees with A D U E on D of E even and modular compacts and A D U U odd on D of E odd again module the compacts. Now uh, proof of this uh, should be an exercise. Basically, the, the trick that we used uh, at, at, as the punchline of theorem 17.8.2, uh, which is theorem that, that uh, OCAT implies that uh, coherent family of unitaries can be uniformized by a single unitary. Uh, if you remember, we had uh, unitaries on longer and longer indices. I mean, basically chunks of unitaries, longer and longer indices, uh, such that conjugation by those unitaries agreed modulo compacts uh, on the entire Kalkin algebra, uh, or, or rather on, on bigger and bigger D of E's. Uh, so uh, the issue that we had to worry about uh, is uh, that, that uh, this unitary group has a center. Center is uh, the scalars. So, uh, which, uh, so, so the, these, these unitaries were not uh, close to one another, but they were close modular multiplication by scalars. You probably remember that there was, uh, you know, we spent some time on those functions, delta sub ij of, of some set f. So we had to, to, you know, to, to twist them a little bit to, to make them click together up to uh, small and small epsilons and to build unitary out of them. Well, exactly the same trick is being used here. Just knowing that the conjugations agree on, on D of E, the small one, it means that, that those unitaries uh, agree there, module multiplying by scalar. So you just have to choose a sequence of scalars and put uh, these together into single unitary. And I'll just leave it at that. And then finally, the end of the proof, uh, OCAT and, and this uh, theorem uh, implies that phi one is inner. And then uh, to get phi, you just com compose it back with conjugation by V and you get uh, inner automorphism, right? So, uh, so, so basically uh, this is, uh, there is still the beginning of the proof missing, right? So we still have to prove that we can get C measurable epsilon approximations uh, on, an R, on some D of E. Right, so at, at this point, so let me just uh, repeat this once again. Uh, so at this point, uh, if we can prove, assuming OCAT, that uh, any automorphism phi, uh, for any automorphism phi, there is some D of E and there is some infinite set X, such that on DX of E, uh, phi has, so if, on the X of E, phi has epsilon approximation, actually C measurable. And uh, even better than that, so if for every epsilon there exists E epsilon and X epsilon, then phi is inner, right? So, so these E epsilons and X epsilons can be completely unrelated. Uh, the isometry trick uh, brings us to the same place. As long as of course, uh, E satisfies the assumption that that length of these intervals converge to infinity and X is an infinite set. So that, that's, uh, that's assumed. All right, so, so we just need to see how to get here. Any questions before I uh, start? All right, so, um, okay, now, now uh, to get that, uh, we'll need uh, sort of uh, what I uh, like to think of as uh, advanced version of, of OCA, uh, which is actually consequence of OCA, but, but uh, it, it is, uh, once you get used to, to, to this axiom, uh, this one is easier to use. Of course, uh, one has to parse the statement, but, but uh, that's of course the price one has to pay. Uh, with, with statements uh, like this. Uh, all right, so uh, let me first uh, just remind you the statement of, of OCAT. It seems like it was a long time ago. Um, so OCAT says that whenever X is a separable metrizable space and we have an open coloring, now uh, what that means is that uh, L0 is open. And remember uh, this is here, 
Uh, this is a set of all unordered pairs of elements of X, which is naturally identified uh, with a symmetric uh, subsets uh, of, of the square. So we have talked topology. And uh, for that, uh, one of the alternatives applies. Either there is an uncountable uh, L0 homogeneous set. L0 homogeneous, of course, means that it's, if you look at pairs from Y, then all of them belong to L0. Or um, there are L1 homogeneous sets Xn for N in N, such that union of Xn's uh, is equal to X. Now, a uh, useful thing that it will be using uh, is that, that uh, because L1 is closed, if you have L1 homogeneous set, then if you take closure of um, that set uh, in the topology with respect to which um, partition is, is open, you get homogeneous set again. And this is essentially where the magic of OCA comes from. You start from some wild object, and uh, if you uh, somehow design your partition so that there are no uncountable L0 homogeneous sets, what you get is countably many closed sets that, that capture your object to, to a reasonable degree. And there is this art of figuring out uh, how to, to define partition. Right, and now uh, here is a strengthening, apparent strengthening of this axiom, uh, OCA infinity. Infinity refers to the fact that now uh, we have infinitely many colors, colorings. So whenever infinitely many colorings in two colors, I, I should not be saying infinitely many colors, that, that's very different. Um, so whenever X is separate metrizable space and we have partition of pairs into LN zero and LN one for each N greater equal than zero, each one is an open coloring. And uh, these open uh, colorings decrease. So the higher n is the, the smaller open, open part is. Then uh, one of the two alternative supplies. First one, uh, there is an uncountable subset of the Cantor set. Look, I'll try to draw it as we go. So here is, uh, so this is how I draw Cantor set. Right, so, so these are branches of Cantor set. Uh, and there is this function f from Z, so Z is a subset, right? So, so subset is, these, these are branches uh, downstairs, you have nodes, uh, F sends it to X. And it has the property that uh, if you take two distinct um, A and B in Z, all right, now, now my, my picture is too small. Okay, let me just see if I can, if I can make it bigger. Okay, so it can, yeah, maybe it's not a good idea to overlap. Right, so, uh, right, I have zoom. So here is A and here is B. Now remember delta of A and B is the first place uh, where they differ where those two branches differ. And now uh, F maps uh, A and B to two elements such that, uh, that their images belong to, to the zeroth color with that very index. So the closer A and B are in, in uh, Z, the, the more uh, drastic uh, is uh, the open color uh, of uh, f of a and f of b, right? So if you just take that all of these colorings are the same, this is just uh, OCA because uh, you just have identity function and, and, and uh, that's it. But, but uh, you see, uh, let me just actually continue reading axiom and, and then I'll, I'll discuss it. So uh, that, that is uh, the, um, the uh, open uh, alternative. It is a bit more demanding uh, than the one in case of OCA, which means that the other one is, is weaker in some sense. So uh, it just says that there are uh, subsets X, N of X. Uh, oh, I forgot. So of course, uh, what I wrote uh, is vacuously true. You also want 
these subsets to cover X, right? So, so that there are subsets of X, X, N, countably many, uh, which cover X. And moreover, uh, if you take the nth set, it is homogeneous for the nth color. Now, uh, the, this, the fact that, that uh, this is the same index as the red herring, it, it makes no difference. All that matters is that, that uh, each of those countably many sets is homogeneous for some of the colors and you can just re-index them, you know, insert dummy sets and do something. It, it makes no difference, but each one of them is homogeneous for something, which is quite weak, right? Because uh, remember, open colors are getting smaller and smaller closed colors are getting bigger and bigger. So it's much easier to be uh, homogeneous for the thousands coloring than it was for the first one. But okay, this is good enough. Now, uh, the advantage of uh, this condition here comes from the fact, and it's going to be very obvious uh, from the proof that we're doing today. Uh, it comes from the fact that, that uh, quite often you have some uncountable homogeneous set. Now you want to somehow refine it to do something with it. Um, and uh, if it's zero homogeneous, quite often you want to reach contradiction. Now, a problem is that uh, each time uh, you uh, do some reduction, you know, typically use pigeonhole principle, you have uncountable set uh, to each one of those uh, elements. So that set you associate some natural number. So uncountably many of them have the same number associated with them and somehow that leads to contradiction. Well, uh, you see, uh, it may be with, with uh, the usual OCA that uh, that number is may, maybe too small and maybe it doesn't work. Now, uh, in case of OC infinity, uh, if you have uncountable set, which is really the image of Z in this case, uh, each of the elements has some fixed natural number we can go to uncountable subsets so that all of them have the same number associated to them. And then uh, and uh, then you just look at this and say, well, in this set, uh, because it's uncountable subset of Cantor set, uh, it has complete accumulation point. So I can find uh, two elements, even uncountably many elements, which are as close as I want, which means that, that their images are going to be in L, 50 million uh, sub zero. And that somehow should clash with that uh, natural number. But okay, this was this was a uh, rambling. So let, let's go back to proof. Oh yes, I forgot to open uh, the chat window. Just, right. Uh, all right, so, uh, right. And now, uh, just, just while I'm still at this slide. So uh, the OCA infinity I uh, introduced uh, back in 20th century uh, as an uh, independent axiom and proved that, that uh, in every model of OCA, it also holds. Um, back then it wasn't clear whether axioms are different or not. And uh, Justin Moore actually proved that, that, uh, that they are the same axiom. So OCA implies OCA infinity. So, so it used to be uh, my axiom, now it's uh, his theorem. Um, anyway, so, so uh, it, it's a simple, it's a very, very clever proof. Uh, so, so let's see how, how it works. Um, right, so uh, maybe, okay, I, here it says. So basically we have uh, set X, so X is separable, metrizable. And we have these open colorings uh, such that uh, they're, they're decreasing as N increases. And now uh, we look at this new set. So this is Cantor set cross X with the product topology. It's still separable metrizable. And we define new partition M0 and M1. Uh, here it is, uh, two pairs AX and BY belong to M0 if and only if, okay, A is different from B, X is different from Y and uh, pair XY depend, uh, belongs to L0 soup uh, delta of AB. Now you'll remind, uh, will recognize that this is exactly uh, what, uh, what uh, these elements are supposed to, to, to uh, satisfy if you have zero homogeneous set. Uh, all right, so now, uh, now, uh, first fact is that M0 is open. Why is that so? Well, if you have AX and BY in, M, in M0, it means that A is distinct from B. So you just need to, to, to you know, basically 
choose clop and subsets uh, which which are uh, you know so that that, that are disjoint. Uh, same for x and y. You just need open subsets of x, uh, which are neighbor disjoint neighborhoods of x and y. Uh, and you want pair x y to belong to this, but but this was assumed to be uh, open um, set. A and you see by also uh, when you choose uh, those um, basic open neighborhoods of a and b, what do they look like? So here is a. Here is B that there are branches in Cantor set. You just make sure to freeze A and B uh, high enough so that, that this delta A B is is, is fro it's, it's uh, preserved. Right. So any anything that that extends A that, that agrees with A up to this point, anything agree, that agrees with B up to this point, they have the same delta. Right. So 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 uh, it belongs here, and therefore uh, M zero is an open. Uh, coloring. Uh, so, so we have two in there, two um, alternatives. Case one. So there exists some y subset of zero one to n cross x, which is uncountable, and m zero homogeneous. All right, so uh, what, what does uh, M0 homogeneity imply? Well, uh, if you look at any two, AX and BY in Y, well, then A is different from B and X is different from Y. So what that means is that Y is really a graph of a function. Right? And you can define Z to be set of all A such that there exists X such that A X belongs to Y. Right. So uh, because Y is uncountable and because uh, all of these pairs are different, this projection is uh, one to one. So it is uncountable and it's subset of the Cantor set. And now how do we define F? Well, uh, so Y is the graph of function F from Z into X. And uh, what is the property of F? Well, here it is, right? If, if you have X and Y, sorry, if you have A and B uh, in, in Z, uh, th th then F of A and F of B belong to L0 uh, of delta AB. So uh, that that, uh, that takes care of, of uh, this case. Now, uh, so, so if case one fails, then by OCAT, we have case two, uh, which is that zero one to N cross X can be covered by countably many sets. So let's not call them X and let's call them YN uh, with the property that at uh, each YN is M1 homogeneous. All right, uh, now, okay, we have to somehow um, get uh, the second alternative uh, of uh, OC infinity. Uh, so just for a moment, fix X, little x in uh, big X. Always have to be careful to, to make sure that my little x's and, and big x's are different. I hope I made it uh, this time. So fix X in, in little x. And now uh, let's say, uh, look at uh, the following. I just need some names. So let's call it, Zn of x to be all a, well, actually all a in the Cantor set, such that the pair a x belongs to y n. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I actually should have said one more thing uh, before I fixed x without loss of generality, 
yn is closed. Right, because uh, we have one homogeneous set, we can just take its closure. Now, what is Zn of x? Well, uh, Zn of x's are, let me just see, I think I need to add one more page. You see, as you can see, I finally realized that I can actually uh, produce my slides to have extra pages before I start, but okay, I didn't put enough, um, a sufficient uh, number of, of extra pages. So, uh, so now uh, what we have is that the Cantor set is covered by the union of Zn of Xs. Uh, they're closed sets. So by, by bare category theorem, at least one of them has non-empty interior, right? And uh, what that means uh, is, uh, you know, because topology is very specific, uh, it means the following, so there exists N and there exists some S in zero, one to less than N, such that Z actually, I should call them NX and SX, they, they depend, remember I fixed this little X, uh, such that uh, ZN of X includes this basic open set. Remember uh, this here, just in case you forgot. So this is all, um, well, let's call them, I don't know, let's call them C, such that uh, S is an initial segment of C. So all of those uh, branches extending is C. Uh, all right, uh, so, so now uh, what, what do we have? Well, there are only countably many uh, such uh, S's. So, uh, So there are countably many pairs, Nx, Sx, uh, and now let X and S be set to all little X such that Nx is equal to N and uh, S sub X is equal to S. Note, uh, if these agree, then it means that, that uh, I mean, if you have, actually I should have said this before. So if N X is equal to N Y and uh, S X is equal to S Y, uh, th then what this implies uh, is that uh, X Y uh, belongs to uh, what was the name of the, of the partition? Uh, sorry, uh, L N right? L sub zero. And uh, what do we have here? Well, the length of S, right? because the branching, no matter what branching happens after S. Uh, oh, I said zero, but I. I wrote zero, but I was thinking one. All right, so they're all in, in, in this. Uh, so uh, each X and S is homogeneous for, for uh, something, uh, whatever the length of S is. And uh, as I said before, uh, this fact that Xn was supposed to be L1n homogeneous was a bit of a red herring. We can just uh, re-enumerate them. Okay, so, and, and you know, here it's, it's important that uh, L1n is bigger than, that these are getting smaller. Uh, so uh, we can re, enumerate X and S as X, J, so that the pairs from X, J uh, are included in L1, J. Okay. Uh, I mean, if, if you really need, you may have to repeat a few of them Okay. Okay. 
So, so you can add as many empty sets if, if necessary. You know, maybe may, may none, none of these is, is uh, L5, uh, one homogeneous, but for some point on, they become homogeneous and then they uh, just line them up and uh, get this. So, so we have OC infinity. Any questions? All right, so uh, let's, let's go now. Uh, we have a few definitions still uh, before we can move on uh, to the main theorem. Now, uh, those definitions uh, describe some intermediate uh, stages between having an arbitrary lifting. Remember, phi star, we just pick at the end of the proof, uh, at the beginning of the proof. Uh, phi star is, is just a lifting with no uh, reasonable properties at all. Uh, and we are trying to get uh, Borel measurable lifting or continuous lifting. And uh, here we have a sequence of um, uh, intermediary, intermediaries between those. And throughout, uh, for definiteness, I look at unit ball uh, with respect to the weak operator topology. And because of that, the uh, Borel structure of weak operator topology. But as I said, it, it doesn't matter really. Uh, okay, so, so definition number one, uh, subset Z of uh, B of H, uh, the ball squared, so, so it's really looks like this. So here is Z. We said it's narrow. If whenever you have two pairs in Z, no, note that the first coordinates are the same, then the second coordinates are equal modulo compacts. Uh, remember what this means is that B minus C is a compact operator. So, so what that means is that if I choose a little A here, this section, it, it may be empty, but if it's non empty, uh, the, then uh, it is, uh, the, I mean, basically all of these are included in a single coset uh, of uh, compact operators um, inside B of H. So that, that's what it means to be narrow. Now, uh, you know, the textbook example of a narrow set uh, is uh, if, you, if you take, take Z, of the form AB such that B is equal modulo compact to phi star of A. Right. So, so and the idea is that, that we do want to, to get uh, our lifting um, by, by looking at narrow sets. Um, weaker notion, uh, it is epsilon narrow if uh, instead of uh, having B and C in, in each section uh, to be equal modulo compacts, they're equal modulo compacts up to epsilon. So what this means, this is equivalent to saying, uh, now it's easier to write it this way, that if I take uh, the image of B minus C in the Kalkin algebra, the norm of this is at most epsilon. Uh, right, so that, that's uh, epsilon narrow. And, uh, oh. Uh, and now uh, next, um, I have to admit this is my terminology, but I realized that, that uh, maybe I should have thought harder. Um, we say that it is sigma epsilon narrow uh, if, if its graph can be covered by a countable family of epsilon narrow Borel sets. Uh, you see, another alternative was to call it sigma Borel, but sigma Borel really sounds uh, silly because you know it's, it's uh, Borel sets are sigma algebra, um, and uh, the reason why this is not silly, we'll see an example in a moment. But but basically, these are unrelated Borel sets, um, and uh, they are supposed to be covering a subset uh, of of this product space, and. Uh, you'll see that, that, that uh, indeed you can have something that it's covered by countable family of Borel sets, which are narrow, but not by a single Borel set that, that is narrow, even more drastic than that. Um, right. Okay. Uh, Okay, let me be more careful here. 
Okay. Right. All right. Okay. Um, and um, now, right. Now we say that endomorphism has a sigma narrow lifting. Uh, if its restriction to the unit ball has a lifting which is sigma narrow, so it's always we just look at restriction to unit ball because this is the polished base. Um, and uh, we have that it, we say that it has a sigma narrow epsilon approximation. Again, if there is a sigma epsilon narrow function theta such that uh, which is epsilon approximation uh, to, to, to a lifting. Uh, okay, now, now this is a mouthful and uh, definitions, uh, I, I guess, uh, don't make sense at first. So, so let's just take a uh, okay, actually, sir, I think there is one more line. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, lifting on D of E, which is sigma narrow, is just a lifting which is both sigma narrow and a lifting on D of E, and same for for uh, the discretization. Uh, these are just analogous definitions. But let's take a look at this one uh, example, uh, which shows that uh, there is a difference between uh, sigma narrow and, and having a Borel lifting. Uh, so, so here is a claim. There is an endomorphism phi of L infinity mode C0, uh, which has sigma narrow lifting, but no C measurable or Borel or continuous or anything reasonable lifting. Now uh, here, uh, the, the unit ball of L infinity, uh, the most natural topology basically can think of it as, as the subspace topology from B of H, but, but uh, really topology is weak star topology. Uh, just thinking of it as a dual space of, of C0, right? Uh, it, it is a, a Polish topology. So uh, here is a uh, definition. So uh, let you N for N in N, Uh, B non principal ultra filters on N and uh, distinct. Now uh, let F of some element A uh, of, uh, actually, let me just say first what is F doing. So F sends L infinity into L infinity. And how is it defined? Well, if I take F of A and want to evaluate it at N, what do I do? Well, I just use my ultra filter to, to tell me what to do. So it's limit as J approaches to this uh, ultra filter uh, of A sub J, All right? So A sub J is a bounded uh, sequence of complex numbers. Uh, this limit exists and, uh, and uh, this is it. Now, now because these are non-principal ultra filters, uh, if A minus B is in C zero, then you can easily check that F of A uh, is actually equal to f of b. No, not just that, that they are equal module C0, but actually they're equal on the nose because these differences are going to be uh, smaller and smaller. Oops, actually not. Maybe, maybe I should say, maybe I overdid it. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. No, 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 this is correct, this is correct. This is correct, right, because uh, for any fixed ultra filter, uh, change by, by something in C0 is, is not going to affect this limit at all. Right? So they're actually called the nose. Uh, all right. And now what that means is that uh, F lifts the star homomorphism phi from L infinity mod C0 in, into, even into L infinity, as I said, but let's say into L infinity mod C0, you can just mod out by, by an ideal. Uh, and uh, it has a sigma 
Borel lifting. Oops. Hmm. Okay. So let me see. So I should have assumed something else about these ultra filters. Before I started. So let um, hmm. I take partition of n into countably many infinite sets, and just make sure that that, that uh, the nth ultra filter concentrates on the n set. Right. So here is n. And we have x0, x1, x2. So, so, so these ultra filters form a very discrete family. So I actually need this. And now, uh, what do we have? Uh, so uh, what is uh, this uh, sigma Borel lifting going to be? No, yeah, sorry about it. Yeah, okay, I, sorry. I, I just have this uh, opportunity, this, this, uh, this uh, tendency to, to, to generalize things in the last moment and forget to check it carefully. Uh, so I'll just rephrase this to narrow lifting. Namely, you have uh, two continuous maps. Oh, it's in there. Yeah, why do I do this? Um, all right, so un for n equal to zero and one. Oops, sorry about this, I forgot to, wait. I thought that I put, do not disturb. Uh, where was I? Right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't need this. Right, so, so what is... F of A at N for N even And for n odd, right. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. This this technology is uh, just too much fun, so I get carried away. So uh, this J goes to U one if n is odd, uh, and uh, now uh, this uh, F uh, has uh, two Borel lifting, so that, that there are two Borel functions uh, that that uh, do it, uh, and uh, uh, but no. Borel lifting. Right, so, so what are two Borel functions? No, did it do it again?
Oh, you know what? Uh, trust me, uh, there is an example. Uh, so I'll just leave it to you as a homework. I think it's, it's more useful uh, uh, to, to leave it at, at least basically, uh, you know, uh, what I did, I, I think I see now what needs to be done. Uh, it's uh, just that, that uh, I didn't take this one seriously. Um, yeah, so, so just play with ultra filters and see that there is a difference. So I think I spent too much time on this already. Um, uh, okay, any questions about this? All right, and uh, here is uh, the main uh, lemma that we'll start uh, proving today. Uh, if you assume OCAT, sorry, uh, just I'm, I'm annoyed uh, at myself uh, for this uh, uh, mix up with ultra filters. Uh, sorry, uh, I just need to turn on the do not disturb here. Um, Yeah, I'll just go on. Uh, it, it's, um, I mean, if, if anybody wants to talk about this in more detail, I guess we can do it after the class, but it, it's really not that important. So anyway, so let, let's go uh, to, to the theorem. So assume OCAT, if he is an endomorphism of Kalkin algebra and epsilon greater than zero, then uh, he has uh, epsilon, uh, sorry, sigma narrow epsilon approximation on dx tilde of E for some infinite x tilde. Right, so, so uh, this is not quite what we, uh, want uh, to prove. Uh, okay, actually, we, we are getting somewhere, right? So, so uh, the first step is getting sigma narrow, uh, this being covered by countly many Borel sets, and then somehow move from countly many to a single Borel set. And uh, yeah, so all right, so, so now setup is uh, actually what we are trying to prove just to remind you a definition. Uh, we want to prove there is a function theta so that, that uh, theta is uh, epsilon approximation of uh, phi. And second, the graph of theta can be covered by countable, many, countable family of Borel sets. All right. So uh, it will be uh, convenient uh, to, to add some more structure on the index set. Uh, you remember that uh, these partitions, uh, we had finite intervals for each index by natural numbers. Now, all countable sets uh, are the same equivalent uh, as far as uh, indexing goes. And this countable set will be more convenient for us. So it's all finite binary sequences. So we'll index the intervals in E by finite binary sequences. So E is E, S, S in 0, 1 to N. Now, uh, we don't want just any E. We want E, which has the property that that uh, limit uh, over all N 
if you look at uh, all sequences that have length exactly n, right? So they're all sequences at the nth level of the tree, there are finitely many, just look at uh, the lengths and minimum, those minimums converge to infinity. Now, what this implies, it, it's uh, strictly stronger, uh, but really what we need is the following consequence. No matter how I choose a branch, uh, let's call branch A in, in Cantor tree, that uh, if I look at E sub A restricted to N, that lengths of these guys converge to infinity as N goes to infinity. Right, so along each branch, these intervals are getting longer and longer. And we might as well assume that, that uh, all intervals at, at the nth level are of the same uh, length. Right, so, so uh, we want this. And now uh, here is uh, another can convention. Ask, can you ask yes. a question? I, sure. I can think on a partition in which to does it happen? Hmm? Oh yes, of course, of course, but I, I'm choosing E. For some, no, okay. I mean, is, isn't two always true for, for partitions? No, no, I, I can take, uh, I can take uh, ES to be a singleton for each, uh, for each S. This is the length, card cardinality of, of, of the mm, end set. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right, so that they can all be very small, right? So I really I want to, to push them. You see, the reason is that we want to use the isometry trick at the end of the day. And for isometry trick, we want these intervals to get longer and longer. Mm -hmm. Any okay. other questions? Okay. Now, uh, here is another convention. Uh, if we have uh, X, uh, which is an infinite uh, subset of the index set, uh, then uh, the set that, that I'll care about are those uh, that are that are included uh, in branches. So, so if I have X, which is basically some pieces of a branch. So if this is X, then uh, essentially if X is a chain in this, uh, if it's an infinite chain, infinite binary tree, then, then there is going to be a unique branch B of X inside this tree. So in other words, I don't care about X that, that, that is not a chain that it has uh, you know, incomparable nodes. Uh, and finally, uh, we fix a discretization of D of E once and for all. Right, so just for each, just was a finite um, epsilon net. All right. So, so here, here we are. So first, uh, fix D, which is big enough, a uh, greater equal than two epsilon, uh, one over two epsilon, and also fix an N. Now uh, we have this set uh, script X, which is set of all pairs X comma A such that B of X is defined and A is in B of X. Now what that means, here is our index set, zero, one to N. So here is X, B of X, is okay, this is supposed to be a branch. Now B of X uh, defines a subset uh, of uh, the indices and uh, actually X does as well. And we just want A to belong to D of X. Now we identify D sub X uh, with a subset of D but by uh, just padding up with zero. So this is, so just means that the support of A is subset of, of, of D of X. Uh, so uh, here I should remind you uh, of this notation Px, which is a projection to the span of all those Cj's. Remember, Cj's uh, are um, uh, the, the fixed basis of our Hilbert space. The span of all Cj's such that J belongs to the union of the n for n in x. I three A in DX is just the same as saying that PX A is equal to A PX is equal to A. Right, so it's really, it belongs to this corner and also it, it is in D of E. Uh, right, so, so this is our set X. 
And uh, we want to apologize. We are going to define uh, an open partition on this set. Uh, and now we take X A in X uh, and basically refine it as much uh, as, as we need to, to have uh, everything relevant be continuous because we are eventually uh, going uh, to, to try to put something as continuous. So uh, we identify it with B of X, right? So, so uh, B of X is uniquely determined by X. Then X and A itself. Uh, now uh, B of X and X are branches in here. A, next sorry, uh, B of X is here, X is here. Uh, A belongs to D. This is a Cantor set, product of finite sets. QX. Uh, in case you forgot what is QX, it is phi star of PX. Right, so so uh, before, at the very beginning of the proof, we fixed a lifting uh, of phi, which sent projections to projections. So QX is a projection to which a PX is being mapped. And finally, phi star of A. So this is some operator of the same norm as A and uh, both uh, QX and phi star of A belong uh, here. They both have norm at most one, right? And now here, uh, these three are Cantor sets. So they have their natural compact metric topology. And the last one uh, is in weak operator topology, also compact metric. So, so we do have separate metric space as we should, and we can proceed to define our partition. And uh, this is, uh, one of the cleverest partitions uh, in the history of OCA. I should say it's, it's uh, basically it's, its grandfather is a partition defined by Boban Velichkovich uh, back uh, 25 years ago. No, 30 years ago. Oh. Um, and uh, okay, so here is, let's, let's take a look at it. Uh, what, what does it do? So uh, we have two pairs, XA and YB, both uh, in this set. And uh, now uh, th there are many indices here, but really only N makes some difference. D is fixed throughout. You can actually just drop uh, D completely. Zero just tells you that this is the open part. So uh, these two pairs are in the open color uh, with index N, if and only if the following three conditions are satisfied. First, uh, these branches determined by X and Y are distinct. Now, let me just, start drawing this as we go. So uh, I'm not going to try to draw X and Y. Ah. Um, but I'll just draw B of X and B of Y. Right, so B of X and B of Y are distinct branches. And by just freezing X and Y at the first place where they differ, you can assure that, that, that uh, this is the case. Now, next condition is that PXB is equal to PYA. Uh, so uh, remember, okay, disappeared, but uh, as I wrote before, PXA is equal to A. Uh, now, how, how do PX and PY uh, differ or relate? You have projection PX, you have projection PY, they branch at some point exactly where uh, BX and BY branch. Now A is something here. B is something here in this corner below PY. So we just require uh, A and B to agree here, to agree at this uh, finite rank projection, which is below both PX and PY. Um, so now this is again, open condition because uh, to assure this, you just need to, to first assure that, that these two branches are different, know exactly from what point on they are different. And then you just have finitely many coordinates that you can have to assure that A and B agree on but uh, these are products of finite sets. So, so it's really just inside this Cantor set, you just need to freeze first finitely many coordinates. So both first conditions are, each of the first two conditions is open or rather more precisely, first condition is open and second condition is open module the first one. If BX and BY are equal, then the second condition is not open. But 
we don't care. And finally, third condition, which is the first one uh, in which uh, N occurs. So here is N. Uh, right, so, so you see, if PXB uh, is equal to PYA, well, uh, they're compact operators. So, so uh, it's, it's not shown once you wipe out the compacts, but you would expect that phi star of A and phi star of PY, remember QY is, maybe I should repeat this, uh, Q of Y is just phi star of PY, that it, uh, it should be the same as uh, phi star of PX, phi star of B. But we are saying, no, it's not. And the uh, difference is greater in norm than one over D. And not only that, it's even greater in the norm uh, after nth, um, nth uh, uh, um, you know, Okay. So, so, so uh, what is uh, this PN infinity uh, modulo complex, this projection is equal to the identity. So the projection P0N is uh, just a finite length projection. So we are saying that from that point on, uh, these two, uh, uh, this storm is greater than one over D. So, so not, not just uh, that, that uh, uh, this norm is non-zero but uh, and, and greater than one over d, but even it shows up late enough. And the, the last condition uh, is uh, similar, except that, that uh, as you can see, um, we have instead of phi star a q y, we have q y phi star a. Of course, if phi star a is self-adjoint, this is the same thing, but but it's not necessarily. So uh, so so this condition is mirror image of the first one. And the third condition is uh, just at least one of these operators uh, has large norm. Now, uh, third condition is open again, module the first two, because uh, we are talking about weak operator topology and uh, one can assure uh, when if, if norm of something is greater than whatever, there is a weak open neighborhood uh, in which that norm is, is also greater than that. Okay, so, so this is an open partition. Right, okay, I don't need this. Um, and now here on this slide, I just repeated uh, the partition and here's a claim which we just proved that uh, for each N, uh, this partition is open and uh, also a bit uh, more obvious fact is that uh, these partitions are decreasing as required by OC infinity. You can see that here, it's the only place where N occurs is this PN infinity. Uh, you know, these, these projections are decreasing as N is increasing. So, so the norms are uh, decreasing as well. All right, so we are in the situation uh, that uh, OC infinity gives us. And uh, today we'll at least be able to prove that there are no uncountable zero homogeneous sets. And then next time uh, we'll see what to do uh, with, with the other ones. Any questions before I go on? Right, so here is again our partition. Uh, and here's the claim. There is no uncountable uh, Z subset of Cantor set. Uh, such that some continuous function from Z uh, into X satisfies that F A F B belongs to M zero D delta A B for all distinct A B and Z. So this literally just says that, that uh, the first uh, alternative of OCA infinity fails. Okay. So let's go to prove it. Assume otherwise. and fix Z and F. Uh, okay, so, so now let's take a look at uh, what uh, that means. Well, you see, uh, if you choose any two X, A and Y, B uh, in, in uh, sorry. Um, so uh, okay. well, let me just state it properly. So for all, now I just used A and B for something else. So let's uh, call them. Uh, 
little x and little y in z. So if they are distinct, then f of x and f of y uh, belongs to m0 d delta of x, y, right? And uh, that is what is what is written up here, uh, what that means. So you see f of x, if f of x uh, is a pair, okay, maybe this was unfortunate choice of terminology, but if f, f of x is a pair x comma a, and uh, f of y is a pair y comma b, then uh, what do we have? Well, first, these branches are distinct and A and B agree on the common intersection. And what this, that means is that I can define C, which is in D of E, so that for every S uh, in uh, zero, one to less than N, C sub S is equal to A sub S for some, okay, I'll just write X A in the image of, really Z doesn't matter. Right, for, for something in the image of Z, if such X A exists. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Just let the CS to be zero. Now, now uh, you see the point is that, that uh, this here does not depend on choice of X A because they all agree. So then CS is equal to AS for every S and for every XA in FZ if, if, such, if uh, such element exists. Okay, so, so what is the picture here? Well, uh, you see DE is uh, indexed uh, by uh, zero one to less than n. Now these, uh, all of these a's are just branches, but now c, c is indexed uh, by the entire tree or by a large enough subset of the tree. And uh, it agrees uh, with each of the a's uh, along its branch. So then for every x a in f of z, if I look at Px times C, it is equal to A. Right, so, so somehow this C collects uh, all of them. So uh, let me just roll back. So you see here, so far I just used these two properties uh, of, of homogeneous sets. So I haven't used the third one, which is the key one. All right, so I have this C. Now, uh, now, now I want to take advantage of the third property. So, so what this means, then uh, if I look at phi star of PXC, it is equal modular compacts to phi star of A. Oh yes. Uh, you see PX, uh, these projections belong to the center. So I could also say that CPX is equal to A. It doesn't matter what side I multiply it on. So I'll just look at the left-hand side uh, computations, but, but I mean, I'll leave this one on hold for, for a while, but uh, we'll come back to it. Now, what is left-hand side? Well, it is equal modular complex to QX times 
phi star of C. Uh, so this, and now I'll, I'll move phi star of A to the left hand side, this minus phi star of A, this is compact. This is Q, sorry about that. Okay, and now here is uh, the moment where it's convenient to have OC infinity. Uh, so find N, uh, which is N of XA, so that when I look at QX, phi star of C minus phi star of A, if I multiply on the left by Pn infinity, right, so as, as N increases, this product converges to zero in the norm. I can make it as small as I want. And I want to, to make it smaller than one over D. Right, and now this looks exactly uh, like the opposite, uh, actually stronger than the opposite uh, of uh, the third condition in definition of partition. Okay, and now here is uh, the OCA infinity moment. So uh, without loss of generality, WLOG, uh, there exists an N such that for all XA in F of Z, N is equal to N of XA, right? Pigeon hole principle. So we have single N which works for all of them. But now, uh, okay, we pass to, to an uncountable uh, subset of Z. Uh, so we have uncountable subset uh, of uh, the Cantor space. Now we can find little x and little y in Z such that delta of x, y is greater than n. Okay. So just if I need greater than n, let me make it 2n. So I tend to forget the proofs in case you haven't noticed yet. In the likely case, you haven't noticed yet. Anyway, so, so just make it big enough. Just uh, make it big enough. Uh, so then, uh, what do we have? Well, then uh, we have two possibilities. Pn infinity, Qx, uh, phi star, B minus, phi star A, Qy, I'll tell you in a moment uh, what these are. Uh, this is greater than one over two N uh, here. Uh, here, what f of little x is x a, and f of little y is y b. All right. So, or there is this other possibility. P n infinity. Uh, here we have phi star b q x minus q y phi star A is greater than one over, wait, why did I? Sorry. Okay. Uh, 
It just seems to be going in wrong direction. Let me. Okay, so I'll just leave this for a moment because I'm not sure what I'm doing but I know what I'm supposed to be doing. So, so let me do what I'm supposed to be doing and, and uh, th then you will see. I'll just put a little question mark here. Um, right, so, okay. So, so uh, what do we have at this point? Let me just highlight uh, the good stuff here. Uh, so we have, that for this N, we have uh, this one, but also something that I actually, well, let me copy this. Um, and uh, we also have uh, the, the mirror image of uh, this condition that uh, P n infinity of phi star C Q x minus phi star A, this is also less than one over D. Right? And uh, this holds for all pairs uh, x a uh, in in f of z. Okay, so so okay, I, I guess we can just ignore this a little bit here. So fix x a and y b in f of z. Yeah, we are getting contradiction. Even even with with my uh, senility, we, we are getting contradiction. Uh, so then, what do we have? Uh, right, so, so it will be useful uh, to write that, uh, let's say I'm running out of letters here. Let's say D is equal modulo epsilon up to N E as a shortcut uh, for the following uh, norm of P N uh, infinity of uh, D minus E is less than epsilon. Uh, just because I have to write this uh, several times. So uh, what do we have? Uh, we have the following. We have that QY phi star of A is uh, what? Well, uh, QY phi star of A is approximately equal by using by using this one here okay i have to i'm pointing at it but uh, let me there is a highlight here uh, using uh, this condition here this is approximately n one over D uh, equal to QY phi star of C QX. Right now that is approximately N one over D. Now I'm looking at, at uh, this side here and the other conditions. So QY phi star of C, this is approximately P star of B QX, right? So, so, so uh, what do we conclude? That uh, QY phi star of A uh, is approximately equal N sub one over D to phi star of B QX. Uh, not actually, I have to 
add this two, right? Like I did this two times. So with n two over d, but what that means is that uh, that that, uh, that condition. Let me write down uh, what it means. So uh, just translating, p n infinity times norm of q y phi star a minus phi star b ux is greater than two over d. And similarly, by doing the mirror image of this argument, uh, p n infinity times, here we have norm of phi star of a qy minus qx phi star of b, norm of this is also greater than two over d. Okay, so therefore, what we conclude, uh, well, uh, remember uh, these pairs, so okay, so since uh, little x and little y were, um, actually it doesn't matter where were they, uh, what mattered is uh, that, that, that uh, f of little x and left of little y were in m d delta x y sub zero uh, because of that. And what is f of x? f of x is capital X a, f of y is capital Y B and uh, th those first two conditions uh, fail uh, for, for, for these. No, 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 sorry, uh, forget about first two conditions. So, so this is uh, in here. Uh, so then uh, we conclude, uh, we have that uh, Delta of X, Y, is uh, less than d over two, right? But but uh, this contradicts z being uncountable, right? But z is uncountable, so so we can choose arbitrarily close elements of z, uh, and uh, this contradicts that. Right, so 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 there is no. Oh, sorry, I went over time. So 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 there is no uh, zero homogeneous uh, set here. Uh, okay, so uh, let's let's finish here, and uh, then next time we'll see what can we do with this once we have this countably many one homogeneous sets. Any questions? Right, and uh, once again, let me just remind you, uh, we have classes next week, uh, the week after that, there are no classes. And, and so, so there's a pause, there's a one week without class and then we have classes again. And uh, yeah, any questions? Okay, so if not, uh, then, uh, then, then thanks and see you next week. Sorry, there's chat. Oh, yeah.